Welcome to Trinity Fellowship in Big Rapids, New Wago, and online. I'm Zach Frederick, and I'm here to get you into the loop. If it's your first time attending with us this morning, we invite you to stop by the welcome desk in the hallway. We'd like to say hello, and we have a small gift for you. And it happens to be Mother's Day, so happy Mother's Day to all moms, grandmas, aunts, or any woman who stepped into the role of being a mother. And Personally to you, Erica Frederick, happy Mother's Day from your favorite and only son. This Friday, 7 p.m., our last Our Story Night. Sharon Kunitz organized this testimony sharing night for the last year, but is stepping away from women's ministry for her next season of life. So ladies, we hope you join us for the last event as three women share their experience with spiritual mothers. A living hope in Christ. A living hope in Christ. What a wonderful title for our women's summer study on the book, First Peter. There are two options for this study, Thursday mornings with child care or Thursday evenings. We hope you will join us for this built up study and register before May 23rd. More info and the registration link can be found at trinityinfo.org slash summer Bible study. Well, that's all I have for you this week. Now you are in the loop. Well, good morning. I got to show something off really quick. Well, first of all, happy Mother's Day to you moms, and, and uh, we're just so thankful for you. I, I know I wouldn't be here without my mom. Um, <clears throat> I know, bad dad joke, so, uh, but we're so grateful for you. Um, and just today, Stu gave me a gift on Mother's Day. It was really nice. He's like, hey, Scott, what do you think about this? It's like, he got, he's, Stu's a hat guy, and he loves hats, and he's got a cool one back there. And he's like, here's a Trinity hat. You got you to gotta cover your eyes for, for this thing you're dealing with with your eyes. So um, try out this Trinity hat. And I said, I really like it. So thanks, Stu. I appreciate that. You want to you wanna take a look at Stu's? He's got a really cool one. He likes the ones that are like this. So... Uh, if I did that, I think you guys would all be like, wait a minute, this guy's trying to be a lot younger than he is. So let's stand together. We get to worship the Lord this morning. We've got a lot going on. We've got baby dedications, and we've got the kids coming to sing with us. Uh, it's going to be great. So let's, uh, let's worship him this morning, and, and let's start with a word of prayer, okay? Let's honor the one who brings us together. God, we are here to worship you. Father, we um, ask that... Uh, that you would remove all the, all of our focus that's on ourself. And help us to lay ourselves at your feet this morning, and to um, honor and worship and praise you this morning. For that's why we gather today is to, to give you honor, give you praise, declare that you are the one and only true God, and uh, and to worship you, for you are our Lord and God. So, Lord, uh, help us to do that this morning. Help us to cast all, off all those things that so easily entangles us and the sin that so easily entraps us and, and uh, fix our eyes on you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
in the, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in the Word, in Deuteronomy, where uh, Pastor Gary's preaching from today, there was, I kept seeing this over and over and over again, the Lord our God, and the Lord our God, Yahweh, the Lord our God, the Lord our God. And so I thought, man, what a great song to start our service with is the Lord our God, all right? Hey, let's do it. Yeah. 
not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Sing it again. blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest rain but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong children dedicated come kind of right up front here and be ready to go I love you Lord oh your mercy never fails me all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God. Sing that again this morning. Fix your eyes on Him. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days have been held in your hands. From the moment 
moment that I wake up till I lay my head, I will see of the goodness of God. Both of our services today will see the dedication of a number of children, a number of them in the second service, and we're happy to have the Odells come and join us for this service. And so we just want to give you a picture of what's happening in the whole of the church family. So we're excited for that, and uh, great pictures and great opportunity. And here's the guy with the best hair. So, <laughs> Gideon has great hair. I, I appreciate great hair. But anyway, it's, uh, so there's some questions that we want to reflect on. Uh, these questions, if we can turn to those, if we would, please. There are a set of questions that uh, uh, Toby Vance, one of our elders, worked through with the parents who are dedicating their children. We know that uh, really we're dedicating the parents, in some sense, to raise their children in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
And there's five tools that we go through. Some of you have been here for a while, have seen these over and over again. But there's five questions that the parents are asked. And uh, these questions, I just want to review them with you. Maybe the next slide, if we could, please. So as you guys think about this, uh, Tyler and Karen, will you take up the sword and shield of prayer every day, protecting your child through prayer? Do you commit yourselves to shepherd your child, Gideon, faithfully teaching and dis disciplining him intentionally, consistently, and redemptively? Is it your promise to seek to be wise mentors to him, equipping him to weigh all matters as unto the Lord? Will you strive to be worthy examples to your child, creating for him a culture of servanthood, other-centeredness? And do you covenant to fulfill the role of encourager by being like God in reviving passion and hope in your child as they go through the hard things of life? And your answer is, we will. Praise God. So I've asked Toby, since he spent time with each of the couples and their, their children, to uh, lead us in prayer as we uh, dedicate Gideon. Toby, if you would, please. We bring, Lord, we bring before you Tyler and Karen O'Dell and Gideon Arthur, and we pray for them right now. You guys can either bow your heads, you can stretch out your hands. We turn Tyler, it on? Pray for them. Is it on or no? Uh, yeah. Thanks, Pastor. Let's pray. Lord, help these parents to live wholeheartedly for Jesus, uh, grow them daily, and help them reach maturity in Christ. Help them be intentional in their individual life, their marriage, their children, child in this instance. Help them to live courageously and boldly. Help them to be persistent in prayer. Help them to walk in humility, repentance, and love. When they fail, pick them up. When they're frustrated, give them patience. When they have conflict, bring peace and reconciliation. When they get angry, calm them down and give them the peace of God. Help them instill faith, hope, and encouragement in their children. Help them to guide their children to Jesus. And when the children are old, are old, when Gideon is old, I pray that he's able to say, like Corey Ten Boom stated, that I do not ever remember not loving Jesus and bless him with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Bless you guys. Thank you very much. We rejoice with you guys. Now, there's a question for you all, because as part of the church family, I'd like you to commit that you will do what you can in prayer and using the ministry gifts and, and that God has given you to help support the Odells and the other families by helping them disciple their children as unto the Lord. So will you commit yourselves to being a faithful church family and supporting them? Very well. And you know what? You can start that this summer. <laughs> uh, uh, children's ministry, Connie asked me to say, you know what? We've had some people pushing really hard for children's ministry for the last nine months, and they need a break. And so we would love for you to just be able to say, yep, I'll give one Sunday, I'll give one Sunday a month, I'll give two Sundays a month. Uh, whatever you're able to do, but we want to make sure that we have a solid children's ministry this summer and give some of our regulars a break. So please, uh, you know, as you just promised to do, make it not an empty promise. If the Lord has given you time this summer, please, please take opportunity for that. Uh, let's pray together for a few other things that are on our hearts. Father, as we think of our church family and we think of um, People in our church who are hurting, uh, Lord, I thank you for Pam Price's successful surgery. We thank you for seeing some folks through conflict. Even this morning, I heard uh, someone working through a hard conflict at work, and we just pray that you'd help us to be able to be peacemakers, to be able to, um, as Toby prayed, not let the anger get a hold of us and the bitterness, but to truly follow you, Lord Jesus. Uh, thank you that you care about uh, the families in, in our church. Uh, you also care about the families that we've sent out, and we think of the Harringtons and their children as they serve in missions. We pray that you'd help them as they equip people, especially in Africa, to be able to pass on the gospel through audio ministries. And uh, we pray as well all the way in Papua New Guinea. We pray for the Jexes that you would bless them using their business skills and other skills that you've given them and their three adopted children. We pray, Father, your blessing upon them. And we think, too, of uh, Lord... Uh, it was many years ago that an older woman took me aside and said, Mother's Day is not always easy for every person in the room. And so we just want to acknowledge, Father, that there's some who would, um, I, I know a number of people in our church who would really want to be moms, and they haven't been able to yet. And so we pray in your mercy that you give them the grace to trust you, and we would pray that you would give them the desires of their hearts. We pray, Father, for those of us who've had hard situations with moms, or perhaps uh, we've lost children, and we anguish even on this Mother's Day. We pray that today you would be gentle and gracious with us, and that you would stir, us, stir up within us the hope that we indeed can be uh, effective in being at least spiritual moms and dads to people, even if we 
haven't had the opportunity to have biological children. And for those who've adopted, Father, help us to rejoice because you've adopted us into your family. And so adoption is a beautiful thing, and we want to say thank you for every child that's been adopted into the families of our church. We love you, Jesus, and we pray that as we go into your word that you would speak to us and encourage us and stir us, challenge us. Do whatever we need individually. Even today, we pray in your name. Amen. As we think of passing the baton, uh, this text came to mind. It may not immediately make sense to you, but a centurion replied to Jesus, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I say to the one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Now, what's amazing is that Jesus, in the next verse, says, as he marveled at this centurion's response, he said, truly, as he turned and looked at his disciples, those who had committed to following him, truly, I say to you, no one in Israel, have I, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. The faith to trust that, that the authority ultimately comes from God and flows through and that we can trust, ultimately, God's authority, because all authority comes from God's absolute authority. And as we consider being parents, especially moms today, but, but even dads, we consider that there is an authority that is given to us, a, re- a responsibility, a requirement, uh, to, in a sense, exercise that authority correctly. Uh, maybe we're reminded that we are an authority under authority. The Bible teaches us in Ephesians chapter 6 that children are to obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. And then going back to the Old Testament, even the passage that we'll look at in a few moments, honor your father and mother, for this is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. So children never outgrow the need to honor their father and mother. And it's fun to see adult children come back and there to honor mom. So yay, adult children who have done that, okay, and been able to do that. So we always have to honor our parents, but while we are minor children, in a sense under their roof, we not only have to honor them, we have to obey them. Uh, Again, the limit of that is if they tell us to do something that's sinful, that goes against the commands of God, then we have to obey God, who is ultimately the higher authority. Now, as we try to think about that, while we can talk to children, and that's good, my focus today is really on parents, because the next verse, verse 4, says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Paul doesn't aim here at parents, but at dads. Don't miss this, because it was only in verse 1 that he used the word parents. So while moms and dads take responsibility for raising their children in the training and instruction of the Lord, who's going to have to give account for it? It's dads. So if you're a dad, suck it up, buttercup, okay? It's time for you to accept your responsibility. It's not, well, I can't do it, let mom do it. It's not. It's our responsibility. Yes, mom has maybe great gifts. She's probably smarter than you. I understand all that. But the truth is, it's still our responsibility. And when it says discipline and instruction, when we talked about those five questions that we asked Tyler and Karen, those five questions related to being a a, a shepherd of their child, of Gideon, of being able to say, we're going to use the rod and the staff, the tools of the shepherd. Now, interestingly, I think these applications have a clear meaning to moms and dads, but I think also it applies, in in a sense to all of us in parental roles. So some of us go, oh good, this sermon's not for me. Well, it is, okay? Because all of us have parental roles. Even if we've, we're single, we don't have any children, or perhaps we're married and we still don't, you have parental roles. You have roles of being an aunt or an uncle. You have roles of being a grandparent, perhaps, that you're pouring into your grandchildren. You have your neighbor child that you're pouring into. I'm so grateful for neighbors who welcomed me in and introduced me to Jesus Christ, okay? Even though they weren't my mom and my dad. And so we have influence on others. That's how Paul saw himself spiritually. He wrote to the church in Thessalonica. He said to them, we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. We were affectionately desirous of you, he describes. A few verses later, he says, we were like a father with his children. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. And so Paul here is not talking about biological children, but about spiritual children. 
that he's like a mom or like a dad to them. And so this, this concept as we go to Deuteronomy 6 applies to all of us. As we think about that, as we think about being father-like in our responsibility, we exhort, we call, we plead to them, we beg them, we charge them, we solemnly uh, call out to them, we urge them, we implore them, we insist upon them, we, 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 we pull them out. That's what God is asking us to do. He, he uses all these words that have overlapped meaning, but, but in a sense, build to say, this is our responsibility. We need to be able to pass on the baton. Now, when we think about passing on the baton to the next generation in whatever way that God has called us to, we ask, what, what is the baton that the Lord wants to, to pass on? And if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, this is the fifth book in your Bible, so I hope you'll turn there in your scriptures. But we read Moses now in Deuteronomy, Deuter, second, onomy, law. So the second giving of the law He's now at the end of his life. He's summarizing all the things that the children of Israel have learned. He's now giving it to them before they go into the promised land. He says, let me remind you of a few things. It's kind of like the farewell speech kind of idea. And he's saying, this is what we want to do. We want to make sure that you fear the Lord your God. That's really what we want people to do. That's what you want your children to do. It doesn't sound right in our culture. Our culture says, no, 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 no. We, we don't fear God. We love God. And I go, yeah, we're supposed to love God too. But fear is this reverent awe, this sense that God is God and we are not. He's the creator, he's the sustainer, he's the judge, he's the king, and we are not. He loves us tremendously, we are his children, but he is still the king. And so there's this fear, but notice it says it's not just for you, but it's also your son and your son's son. So it's not just our generation, it's the next generation and even the generation that follows. Why do we do this? That your days may be long. Remember in Ephesians, it says this is the first commandment with a promise. This is the promise. This is where it's coming from, that your days may be long. How are we to bring them up in the Lord? How do we pass on the baton? We pass on the baton in such a way that our children, or our, our spiritual children, have an understanding of the reverent fear of God. There has to be a reverence I mean, I, I, everyone's like, well, God is just our heavenly father and we can cozy up to him. He's our buddy, buddy. I'm here to tell you when Jesus walks into the room, we're all on our faces, okay? That's just the way it's going to be. When you see the worship in heaven described in the book of Revelation, everyone's on their faces because he's still God and we have to understand that. So as we fear the Lord, what do we remember? We remember that the Lord, as Scott mentioned, is Yahweh. So some of you are maybe new to the Bible and you'll find that L-O-R-D, Lord, capitalized, is a way that even publishers today will translate the name Yahweh. They do that because Jews were, didn't want to take the Lord's name in vain and so they typically never said the name of God. They were told, yes, no, take the Lord's name in vain, they then applied it, don't ever say the name, so you can't mess it up. Our publishers go and say, well, let's show respect for that history. We won't write the name Yahweh, we'll just write Lord, okay, all capitals. When it's small, it's the word Adonai, and a different name for God, just God, basically. So the thing is, in the Bible, it never says that you can't write Yahweh, and it never says you can't say Yahweh. It's that you can't, you shouldn't take the Lord's name in vain. How do we take the Lord's name in vain? That's when we treat the Lord's name, which isn't just the name Yahweh, but the very character of God as something light and fluffy, like it's no big deal. Our culture, OMG, oh my God. People say that all the time. That's taking the Lord's name in vain, because you're treating it like God is a comma. God is an um. God is a, a, a little statement to make. That's what we don't want to do. We want to truly honor that God is Yahweh. He's the God who makes covenant with us. He gave his name, Yahweh, or some older translations, the King James especially, would translate the four Hebrew letters as Yehovah, Jehovah. And we can argue about the pronunciation, but clearly God has helped us to see, this is my name, why? I have the character that we sang the first song, that, and even the second song, I will be faithful to you. I will see you all the way through. Now with that introduction, a little bit long, let's go to Deuteronomy 6, okay? 
So as we go to Deuteronomy chapter 6, this text is, if you ever take a Christian education class, you're going to take this text, okay? It's always in a Christian education class because it covers how do we help the next generation get it. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them. To do what? The statutes that God had given, the law that he had given. Why? That it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly. So we add that to verse 2, so that you may live long in the land, and we have all these promises. So what are we supposed to do? If we're going to pass on the baton, the first thing we must do is make sure that we've got the baton. We've got to come and say, you know, that we are willing to be careful in our obedience, carefully handling the word of God ourselves, that we have this reverent awe of saying, it's the word of God. Not that we treat the Bible and put it up in the highest place in our house and get the finest leather. It's that we submit to what God's word teaches us, that we're careful to obey, that we don't add to it and that we don't take away from it. Then we come to verse 4, which is called the Shema of Israel. Shema is just the Hebrew for hear. Hear, O Israel. Yahweh, our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh, your God, with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Yahweh is one. This is not a contradiction of what the rest of the Bible teaches, that their God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons, which is indeed a mystery. What this is saying is that Yahweh is the one and only. He's the one and only God. And because he's the one and only God, he's the one and only creator. It's not a battle of equal forces of darkness and light. It's not yin and yang. It's it's not two forces against. It's God is God, and he created everything. And because of that, we are to love the Lord our God, Yahweh our God, with everything that we have. What does Jesus call verse five? The greatest commandment. Do you remember in the New Testament, you go to uh, Matthew 22, for example, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And you go, well, why, why aren't the exact words the same? Some places it's, it's three words in the, in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, and then it's three words here in Matthew 22, and elsewhere it's four words. It's all trying to capture the Hebrew idea of heart. I've said this to you many times, but we still mistake it because the heart in the Old Testament isn't your emotions. It's not just your emotions. It's the seat of government. It's where your decisions are made in life. That we're to love God with our decision maker, with how we think through things, how we feel through things, how we process things. That's what God asks us to do. So if we're to be good parents and good parental figures, we must pass the baton well. And to do that, we must ourselves have complete devotion to God. It's not enough to say, I handle the word carefully. We must love God fully with everything that we have. You can't ask your kids or your protégés to go where you're not going. Right? They figure this out. Our kids go, yes, you talk about it being really important to love God, but you don't love God. You talk that it's really important that we're in the Word, but I never see you in the Word. I never see you wrestling with how to welcome the truth into the daily decisions of life. We ourselves must love God with complete devotion. We must have a firm grip on the baton. In addition to having that firm grip, we also, if we're going to pass it on, You have the baton, you're careful with it, you have a firm grip on it, you're fully devoted, you're right there, but you've got to pass it on, and that's exactly what the text says. Moses says to the people, these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You'll you'll make sure that you're remembering this, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and you'll talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise. So in other words, all the time that it's not a Sunday morning event. It's not a Sunday school event. It's not a Bible study event. Yes, all those things are important, but it is an all day, every day, whenever the teachable opportunity is there. To pass on the baton, we have to come and understand that we have to be full time in teaching. Every one of us, whether we are parents right now actively with younger children, or whether we are in parental roles in other lives, we must realize that we're always teaching. We're always passing something on. We're always sharing something. And it's true how we do it as well as what we say. 
And so we recognize that we have to be intentional and constant. In the text there, it also says take the word and wrap it around your, your hands and then put it like a frontlet on your, on your head. So conservative Jews, right? You've seen Hasidic Jews, right? And they'll have this black strap wrapped around their head. They have scripture there. And they have a little box on their head called a phylactery, and they put scripture in there. Now, is that what we're supposed to do? I see no phylacteries in the, in the congregation, okay? I'm not even sure that they needed to take it literally like that. I think like the book of Revelation, where it says that we would have the number of the beast on our hands and on our foreheads, it's perhaps symbolic, not an actual number or a chip or something like that, but rather what it is is that our hands, what we do, and our heads, what we think, are all controlled by the dark side of the evil one seeking, who seeks to devour us. And perhaps here we're told, no, make sure that your, your thinker and your doer are all under the word of God. So whether it's literal or figurative, they also would mount it on the doorposts, right? So if you go to Israel, you can buy one of these little uh, ceramic things that you put on your doorpost and you put a scroll, usually of the Shema, and you put it in there. And so when you go out or in, you touch it. Now that's not a bad tradition, okay? But it can become rote. And you go, yeah, I touched it. Why did you touch it? Because you're really wanting to say, when I go out, I'm thinking about God. When I come in, I'm thinking about God. Everything is under the lordship of God. So running the race means having a firm grip on the truth. It means being willing to pass it on, though. I want to challenge you. A lot of us say, you know, that's your job, Gary. You're supposed to pass it on. Yeah, that's, that's one of my jobs. But it's also yours. You have opportunity to connect with people that I'll never have the same opportunity. You have a chance to pour into someone. God has someone for you to take the truth and to be able to say, I pass it on. As parents, you're the primary disciplers. Our children's ministry isn't here to replace you. Our youth ministry isn't here to replace you. They're here to support you and encourage you. But the responsibility is yours. Now, I believe if we do this, if we are willing to grab hold of that baton and pass it, we can become weighty persons. When I mean weighty, I think of a, a little statue that's on my desk, has been for the last almost 40 years. It's a little pewter figure, about six inches high. You see his nose is a little flat because he's fallen over a number of times. And, boom, and the little nose is now, you know, like a boxer's nose. But anyway, but this little guy, Kathy, gave this to me when I was ordained. And you go, why did she give you this guy? You've never worn a string tie in your life. But, but she gave me this because she was trying to say, Gary, I want you to be a man of weight. I want you to have substance. I want you to, 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 to carry weight in what you do in your ministry. And you're going to do that by hanging on to the Holy Bible, the Word of God. And that little guy has stood on my desk for a long, long time, reminding me in the midst of everything, be a man of weight. Be a man who stays faithful, who hangs on to the Word, who handles it carefully, who loves God fully, and then who tries to pass it on. Now, you may not have a little statue, but, but that's what God is calling you to as well. In the parental roles, we must understand that my life verse maybe should be your life verse. Okay, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Success isn't just passing the baton. It's passing the baton in such a way that they can grab it and then pass the baton. You see, that's, that's success as a, a runner. This is not an individual race. This is not just a sprint. This is all of us carrying a baton. If you've started the race with Christ, you have a baton. And you are asked to try, by God's grace, to pass the baton. And then as they take the baton, you pray that they would be able to pass the baton. That's what we're called to. Now, the rest of this passage in Deuteronomy underlines all this by going to the worst case scenario, and that's dropping the baton. How do we drop the baton? How do we mess it up? Well, look carefully. We, again, first we have to have that firm grip, we have to be willing to pass it on, but we drop it when, as the text says, verses 10 through 12, if you look in your Bibles, 
It says, when you get into the land, you're going to get wells that you didn't dig and farms that you didn't plant, you know, and all these buildings you didn't build. You're going to get all this stuff, Israelites, when you go into the promised land. And when you get there, verse 11 ends, when you eat and are full, then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. We may not be going into a literal, physical, promised land, but we have been called out by God to go into what he has for us. And as we move into the future of living in the kingdom of God, we have to realize that we can drop the baton if we forget the Lord. And you go, how can we forget the Lord? No one forgets the Lord. Well, what's the text telling us? They would forget the Lord because they are content and distracted by the blessings that God gives. So when God gives you blessings, some of you have been healed from COVID, some of you have gone through and, and you have finances that you didn't imagine that you'd have, some of you are living in homes that you, you couldn't believe that you would ever live in, you're driving cars that you like, some of you have been blessed with relationships that, that you thought three years ago would never be possible. And in the midst of it, it's so easy to start focusing on the blessings of God. Like last week, Luke 15, the elder brother, he wanted the blessings of the Father, but not the Father. He forgot the Father. And we have to just realize this is a temptation for all of us, that we indeed can be distracted by the blessings of God. And when you do, when your children see you wrapped up more in the stuff that you have, wrapped up more in your home and your car and your boat, wrapped up more in, in, in the other stuff instead of in the Lord, you're gonna hear this horrid sound. There is no more terrifying sound than to hear the baton is dropped. Another dynamic that causes us to drop the baton is that as the text goes on, it is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear, you shall not go after other gods. When they went into the promised land, there were all these people with all these other false gods. And God said in Judges, you're supposed to get rid of all these people, make it appear, but they didn't. Last year when we studied Judges, you saw that. And these people were a thorn in their flesh, and, and they ended up attracting them to say, maybe there's some other way that we should worship. Maybe there's some other God who can give us what we want. Now for us, we go, well, what does that mean? How do we go after other gods? Most of us don't have little you know, statues of wood or metal. You don't bow down with idols. You don't do, I haven't heard anybody doing that lately around here. I think what happens is that we adopt the world view of out there. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 17? We are in the world, but not of the world. What I think is that a lot of us in church in general are in danger of becoming of the world. Not just in it, but of it. We, we wrestle with it because we're of the world. Uh, I'm reading a book that's pointing out all these things. We're still trying to figure out responses to the government. We talked about as elders yesterday, what's a disputable matter, what's not. We're wrestling through trying to figure out issues that we've never had to figure out before, at least not to this detail. But as I read this book and I'm working through it, they point out and said, here's our world, cancel culture. The church has already figured out how to do cancel culture. I disagree with you, you're canceled. We, we, we live in a world that says there's no right and wrong. It's just what I feel. We struggle with that in church. This is what my conscience says, so it's right. And I go, well, your conscience can be fooled. We must go back to the scriptures. That's what Moses is telling us. Respect the word of God. And so we have to be so very, very, very careful. We, we struggle and we say, you offended me. So therefore you're an oppressor, so I don't need to listen to you. And you go, really? Oh yes. I offend people all the time, you know? And, and not intentionally, I'm not trying to offend for the sake of offending, but when you handle the scriptures and we're in the world and the world starts to get in us, the scriptures are going to be offensive. A third warning is found in verse 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Massa. Massa, remember, is the Hebrew word that means testing. Massa and Meribah, grumbling and testing. Back in Exodus 17, the people were thirsty, there was no water to drink, and they complained. They said, Moses, we don't have any water, would you get us some water? Moses said, God, God, they don't have water, would you get us some water? God said, strike the rock and the water will come, the water came. If that's how it happened, it would have been okay. 
I think. But that's not what the people did. They tested God. They said God doesn't love us. If God hasn't provided water, he started, he took us out of Egypt where we had good food and lots to drink and he brought us out here to die. We don't trust his character. You see, what they did is they tested the Lord because they said, I don't think he's faithful to his name. What's his name? Yahweh, the covenant faithful God. And we have to see that, that, that it's a temptation for all of us to test God. This is the passage that Jesus quoted, right? In, Mark, in, Matthew, 14, in Matthew 4, he's dealing with the temptation with Satan. Satan takes him up to the high place and says, hey, Jesus, let's go way up here. Jump off, because I've got verses for you that promise you that you'll be okay. Just trust God and jump. And Jesus says, you shall not test the Lord your God. It's not that Jesus didn't trust God enough to jump. It's that he trusted God enough that he says, I don't need to test God. Some of you in your marriages, you're like, okay, I've got to test them again to see if they really love me. I've got to test them again. It'll destroy your marriage eventually because the other person says, you don't trust me. Now, we're not perfectly trustworthy people, but God is perfectly trustworthy. We're like this when we act, well, with presumption, and we don't want to do that. So we need a firm grip. We need to be willing to pass on the baton. We need to make sure we don't drop it, that we keep our focus. And then the question is, what is the baton made of? This is a wonderful ending to Deuteronomy 6, okay? So we don't want to drop it through these these different ways of of messing up like we showed. We want to pass it on. Look, verse 20 in your Bible. When your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that Yahweh our God has commanded you? So in other words, your next generation is coming and saying, why do we need to obey God's commands? Why do we need to do what God says? basically. And how are we to answer? Because he said so. See, sometimes as parents, don't we, why do I need to listen to you? Because, why do you tell me to be in at this time? Because I said so. Let me tell you, that doesn't work. You need to be able to say, this is what you are to say. This is what you shall say to your son. And where it begins is not where most of us think. It begins with this verse. We were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt. And the Lord, Yahweh, brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. So where does it begin? Why do we have to obey God? Because he's God? No, but because he saved us. Because he brought them, the Israelites, out of Egypt, and because he brought you and I out of the slave market of sin. Obedience isn't onerous. It's a delight when you remember the first part of the why. Because he has saved us. For the Israelites, he brought them out of Egypt. For us, he brought us out of being slaves to sin. When you have truly remember what God has done for you, it's not hard to be loyal to God. We forget, though. We minimize sin. We kind of say, well, what's God done for me lately? That's testing God, too. This week, I had the opportunity to teach down in Indiana, and uh, as we were teaching this business setting, I was giving opportunity to some of the people to say, give us some good examples and, and how you've seen it work in your company. And this one, a little bit older gentleman, said, well, I just need to tell the story that it was probably close to 30 years ago now. He goes, I was caught up in drinking in a horrible way. My marriage was at the end, and it was just, just terrible. The company was much, much smaller. And the boss invited me and some of us to go to Promise Keeper. Some of you remember the big stadium events for men. And they went to a Promise Keeper event. And he says, and the event was good, but it was in the evening, as we were back in the motel room, that I poured out and was honest about what I was dealing with. And my boss didn't say, you're fired. He said, let me help you. And he became an accountability partner and provided resources. And so 30 years later, this man remembers that. And is it hard to follow his boss? Oh, every once in a while, probably. But there's a loyalty because he remembers that God used his boss to help, quote, save him from alcohol. You see, when you and I remember 
what God has saved us from. Even if you were raised in a Christian home and you think yourself a pretty good person, God not only saved you from all your yuck and all your pride and all the wrong reasons why you did the right things, he saved you from what would have been had he not saved you. I would not be a pretty picture if God hadn't saved me some 45, 50 years ago. I could figure it out, 47 years ago. I, I wouldn't be, and you probably wouldn't either. And when we remember that, and God says, do this, and you go, I don't understand why. I don't, I don't realize, no one, you do it, why? Because he brought you out of Egypt. And then, not only the why, the what? That's following the commands of God. The text says, the Lord commanded us to do these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always. That brings us right back to the beginning. What do we, what's God want us to do? To fear him, to reverence him, to obey him. And you go, but that's onerous, that sounds religious. It's not, it's relationship because he brought us out of Egypt. He says, do this, and you say, I will. I delight to do it because God is good and it is always for our good. Obedience is always for our good. It's not always easy, but it's always for our good. You can almost hear a parent saying that, can't you? You don't like this, but this is for your good. Okay, we're more like God than we think when we say that, okay? We may say it not quite with the right attitude, but it, it's really there. So why do I make such a big deal about submitting to the scriptures? Because as we think about submitting to the scriptures, these statutes are always good for us. Now we're not under the Old Testament law. We're not under Mosaic law anymore. New Testament makes that clear. So we don't have to put, you know, phylacteries, and we don't have to have exactly the Sabbath laws that they had, and we don't have to have the clean and unclean, and all the food is clean now. Someone said to me recently, Jesus loves bacon. You know, it's, it's just, um, it, 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 as we deal with that, we're not under the Mosaic law. But we can learn from that, and most of the Mosaic law in principle is repeated in the New Covenant passages in the Scriptures, the New Testament. Why do we obey? because they're always for our good. So we don't want to. As wives, we don't want to submit to our husbands. And you go, well, I don't think it's good. You don't trust God. We have to submit to other authorities, and we don't like to. I don't like submitting to anybody, and I doubt that you do. But you do it, why? Because you trust that God is good, and that he has good. How do I know God is good? because he sent his one and only son to live on this earth, to go through the muck as a poor man, to walk sinlessly, to die on a cross, a horrible death, taking the full wrath of a holy God upon himself that my sin deserved, rising on the third day, ascending into heaven, sending his Holy Spirit, and, and, and for me to say I won't listen to God? It makes no sense. You say, does God love me? If God never did another thing for us, that should be enough. He brought us out of Egypt. Speaking figuratively. In theological terms, as we now live out our righteousness, it becomes righteous, not because we earned the righteousness, but because it becomes our righteousness. You see, when we trusted Christ, when we were brought out of the slave market of sin, God gave us Christ's righteousness. But the Bible also says now we live out a righteousness, that is we live rightly. Why do we live rightly? To earn salvation? No, we live rightly because we are saved. You see the difference? I mean, the, the religion is trying to be right so I can be saved, but understanding the grace of God is I have been brought out. Of, why did God bring them out of Egypt? Because they really had potential. No. They were idiots, and so were you and I. He didn't save you because, wow, I saw potential in them. He saved you out of his mercy and grace. And as we understand that and receive the why, then the what of obedience to God is easier to do. What is the baton? It is that God brought us out and that indeed we can live out the righteousness that his statutes are good always. As we think of all this, I think just quickly as we end of the book of Judges. Remember last year we studied it in the spring and early summer? Judges, and this passage, the people served the Lord, Yahweh, all the days of Joshua, 
And all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done. So Joshua, remember, it was only Joshua and Caleb that came into the promised land of that one generation. And then, now, it's the elders who are in the church, in church, yeah, in the gathering of God's people. I shouldn't call that the church necessarily, confusing. But in the people of Israel, they, and indeed, remembered what God had done. They had seen the, the wilderness wanderings. But then the text down in verse 10 says, and all that generation also was gathered to their father. So now we're talking a third generation, and a generation arose after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And they ended up dropping the baton. Whether we like it or not, we have been entrusted with the baton of the gospel. I hope you like it, okay? But it's also our responsibility to do what we can. Now, someone has to take hold of it. We can't take hold of it for them. You want to take hold of it for your child. You can't make your child a believer. That's their choice. You can't make your friend a believer. You can't make your parents a believer. But the best chance to pass on the baton is for you to firmly grip it and then to graciously pass it into their hands. Bruce Wilkinson has an illustration that he calls the three chairs. And I've shared this with you before, but it's one of the illustrations that sticks with me so strongly. If we put it into the terms of today's message, the person who sits in the first chair, the servant's chair, by the way, that's the person who gets the why and the what. What's the why? He brought us out of Egypt. What's the what? Follow his commands. Be careful with his statutes. But the next generation doesn't start there. The next generation usually just gets, what's the what? Keep the commands. Go to church. Be a good person. Try to do your best. You know? My mom's statement to me, going to school, have fun, do your best, and be good. I heard that every day of my life growing up, okay? But I didn't hear God has brought you out of Egypt. And then the third generation after that looks and says, well, the only reason my parents did this is because they followed the rules. They just did what grandma and grandpa said they ought to do. And they themselves are all the way with neither the why nor the what in the cushy chair. I don't know what chair you're in right now, but I want to tell you that your children never start in the first chair. And the only way we can influence children, whether ours or someone else's, spiritually or literal, is for us to choose the first chair. Will you today choose the first chair? Will you be someone who makes it easy for me to do your funeral. What's an easy funeral? You talked about the why, and you walked the what. Kathy's mother was an easy funeral. She talked about the why, and she walked the what. Hard funerals is when someone talks about Jesus, but doesn't live it. Hypocrites. Hard funeral is people who live pretty good but never talk about Jesus because you're going, are they just trying to be good in themselves? Because that's not going to make it. How do we pass on the baton? Well, we need to do both. We need to do everything. And I want to encourage you. I found a new word this week, okay? This is where we wrap up. This new word, a telephobia. I was like, okay, I've never heard of this. Many of us suffer from this, by the way. This is the fear of being imperfect, Okay, I had it this morning before the sermon when I practiced, okay, this morning. I was like, oh my goodness, I got so many thoughts, this is crazy. But this is the fear of being imperfect. And so what happens that we don't do anything? My friends, you're gonna mess up as spiritual parents. You're gonna mess up as mom and dad. You're gonna make mistakes. A great honor happened to me this week. Our oldest son is with us, Ben, and his wife, Lindsay, wonderful gal. But I got to, to teach at where he works, and he had to introduce me. I have to tell you, that's a whole new level of what's going to happen. Because Ben has known me his whole life, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he's introducing me, and we hadn't talked ahead of time how he was going to introduce me. And, and he, he told them I was cheesy. <laughs> but that was at the end. But he said something very, very kind. And I just share it because it encouraged my heart when he said, you know, dad preached and has preached for, for 38 years on Sunday, but I've seen him try to live it Monday to 
to Saturday. And he lived with me for a long time, okay? And, and he is a joy in my heart. But I had written in my notes, not knowing how he would introduce me, other than cheesy, and, and I thought, you know, my real heart's desire is that I would be a man of integrity who when he messes up, he owns up. So dads, if you've messed up, own up. Don't say, I have a fear of not being perfect. Your kids, spiritual and literal, need you to try. Take responsibility and initiative, TRI. Moms, that's for you too. Take responsibility and initiative. For those of you who are single parents, and you're going, oh, it'd be so much easier if there was, yes, it would be. Parenting that's not tag team is brutal. Let the church help you work together to be able to pass on the baton. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your mercies and grace. <laughs> thank you for uh, your kindness in our lives. We love you, Jesus, and uh, we give ourselves to you to serve you and to, to do what we can to pass on the baton. Amen. And thank you, Jesus, for a timer that gets stuck at 30 minutes, so I think I'm just rocking it. And then I go, we're still at 30 minutes, okay? It was a 30-minute sermon, even if it was 40. So praise God, he has his sense of humor. So let's worship together as, uh, as we uh, close our service. <laughs>
Fantastic. So let's stand together. We're going to sing this song. They've been actually singing this hymn, this next song that we're going to do, How Great Thou Art. And uh, we thought we'd do it together. And uh, you guys have been doing it kind of a really cool way. So we're going to try and do it the really cool way, like you guys have been singing it, okay? Is that okay? All right. Wait, hang on, wrong key. It was bad. That'd have been really bad. Oh Lord, my God, when I am awesome.
Amen and amen. We want to encourage you that out in the hallway there are some photo booths. And so there are folks who are ready to take your picture, especially your family pictures or whoever wants a picture. We'll take it on your phone so you have a nice group picture, but we'll also uh, take it for us as well. So we would love for you to do that on your way out. We, I think, am I right that the roses didn't come? Correct. I think there's a shortage of roses. I, no, I, seriously, the flowers and stuff. So the flowers that you normally would get uh, on Mother's Day for Right to Life, they are, are not available. Some of you, though, did order T-shirts with the Big H Hope that we celebrated at Easter, and those are available out on a table for you to pick up and, uh, and go from there. So yeah, We you could can, have some cool hats on sale, too, sometime. I'm not really sure. Cool hats, yeah. Right well, yeah, Stu's, got a, Stu's got a little side gig going of Stu hats. Yeah, yeah that's uh, good. Stu hats. Yeah. Stu's hats. That'd be great. So anyway, how about if we pray together? Father, thanks so much for the chance to just be family with each other, to laugh together, to enjoy the children leading us in worship, and to be able to declare you are a great, great God. Father, we really do want to not only take the baton, but pass it on effectively. So I pray that even this week you would lay it on our hearts somehow that we can pass on a baton, perhaps to our children or our children's children, perhaps to the nieces and the nephews, and perhaps to our neighbors, but somewhere, Lord, that we can pass on the good news of Jesus Christ, that you, the Lord God, have made a way for us to be bought out of the slavery of Egypt, so to speak, and that you've made a way for us to live that is always good. Even when it's hard, it's still good. Send us with your blessing. Help us to honor those who today deserve honor. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us again. Happy Mother's Day, moms.